Awesome. So thank you everyone for attending our second First Friday uh, webinar of November. Uh, we are joined by Kurt from Malum, who has uh, been gracious enough to present today and has been uh, historically a, a wonderful presenter uh, about this particular topic in, in years past. And so he's going to talk to to us about uh, program presentations and engagement. And so turn it over to Kurt. Thanks, Ian. And it's a, a, a nice small group. So I would almost encourage people to interrupt me because we it doesn't have to be, you know, it's okay. <laughs> in this format, um, I, I'm, I'm certainly flexible enough to, to answer questions as we go. So I'm going to share my screen. I do have some slides prepared. Um, and I think the goal uh, over the, let's see, hit. Okay. Can everyone see that screen still? Yes. Great. And I'm going to try and keep everyone's faces as uh, on my screen. So um, maybe, I don't know if uh, someone can maybe look at the chat in case, because I, I can't do too many things at once. And if yep. there is, if, if, if you just want to put something in the chat, that's fine. But I, again, hit unmute and say, Kurt, could, could you stop for a second? And just, I don't understand what you just said or something like that. That would be wonderful. So, And I'll monitor the chat for you, Kurt. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So anyway, uh, title of the presentation is You Got This. <laughs> um, and we were just talking, a couple of us earlier, that uh, sometimes presenting a presentation or writing an abstract, the weight of the entire thing just maybe inhibits people from Take, is stepping forward and saying, I can do this. And and I think this is in some way um, a primer to say you absolutely can and you should. And and there's lots of great reasons to do that. So before we get started, uh, I'm sitting in Portland, Oregon. And so I wanted to recognize that, uh, you know, they're from a place of equity and inclusion, which is the way Malam approaches our work. Uh, we want to respect the original stewards of the land um, and recognize that, uh, our work together should be elevating the voices of those that haven't been heard. And so um, as we consider uh, all of our work moving forward to just recognize that the, uh, those that came before us and still and still are here as stewards of the land are to be um, kept forward and kept present. So my agenda is pretty simple. I have kind of four sections, uh, overcoming anxiety, uh, these helpful hints to prepare, helpful hints to avoid, and then some some resources at the end. And I guess I'll I'll, I'll start again with the uh, introduction. So um, I'm Kurt. This is uh, this is that's me. <laughs> um, you can see I'm trying to have a little fun, a little thematically with uh, 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 my visuals. But I've uh, been a par I am a partner with Malam Architects. I've been with the firm for 26 years, but I've been in the architectural profession for 30. I've spent most of my career really working with so many of you and your peers in crafting um, design that is student-centric and really leaning into um, not only best practices, but the understanding of the, the lived experience of our, our student populations and their needs. And it's been re really rewarding to do that. And along the way, I have been presenting quite a bit and, um, to just let you know that uh, I, hopefully I have some lessons learned and some perspective that I can bring to the table. But um, I have enjoyed um, engaging with Northwest Akuho, Akuho, and many other uh, organizations as well in, in sharing content and then engaging because I'm learning as much as hopefully I'm imparting when I do this. And so that's another nice little hint when you um, do present, you're you're getting a lot out of it as well. Um, so why is all this important? Um, there's a number of things that I've thought of. Well, first and foremost, uh, learning to present and and uh, speaking clearly uh, helps communication um, with your teams, right? Um, you engage all the time in physical space with your your teams, your uh, direct reports, your your um, your um, leadership, and so that's a a key aspect. It just continually hone this um, the skill. 
you also are engaging with students, the student communities and stakeholders and, and stakeholders might be defined as your custodial team, your facilities teams, uh, a a academic uh, partners. Uh, and so learning to be clear learning to be compelling um, is just a great skill set. I think advocating <clears throat> and motivating your your teams is also an uh, important skill. It's one thing to just show up and have a monotone voice and explain who's doing what and when, but to really get them excited about their impact on the student lives or or uh, the impact in the department, I think is is uh, something that I've thought about. It's important because you are sharing knowledge at conference and, and speaking engagements like Northwest of Kuho, which I think is kind of our center. Um, to encourage you to consider an abstract. You're demonstrating your own personal experience and, and, and uh, demonstrating confidence in the subject matter. And this is just ongoing personal, personal professional growth. You can see that I started speaking, my first conference was Northwest Coup in 2007. Now I probably just dated myself, but um, throughout that journey, it's been so rewarding to, um, to present and to learn and to grow. Um, and it's just been great. So some of the reasons why this whole thing is important. So let's talk about overcoming anxiety. So I would say that the biggest, the biggest issue that prevents people from, from, uh, being effective or even submitting an abstract or speaking is just the, that, that nervousness, that anxiety. And so uh, being prepared is the key, whether it's actually practicing your, your presentation or just making sure you have a good command of the content. So I wanna talk about these, these uh, five topics. So what is your why? What do I mean when I say that? Um, you, you, have a, you have something to say. You have a message that you want to convey. So what is it? If you're just doing it because someone told you you should, well, that's not going to work out well. You you need to bring something to the table. Um, so what is your why? Uh, why do you think this subject matter is important for Northwest Akua or important for your peers to hear about? And then similarly, um, when you think about your learning outcomes, right? What do you think the audience will learn from you um, sharing your experience or your your thoughts? And then one of the big ones is, is this something you're super passionate about or, or you have a deep connection to? That goes a long way in instilling confidence and um, conveying the message that's powerful. Um, if you're being asked to deliver content that you're not really familiar with, that's that's really hard. It's actually, and it comes across that um, may, maybe you're not as, as passionate about it. So well, understanding the why. Understanding your content similarly, um, now that you have this big idea that you wanna share, you need to organize it. Um, and you need to think about, do you have personal experience with the content? Um, uh, is it something you learned in, in college or that you, uh, you know, in, in your personal life? Um, do you have personal or professional stories to tell? Storytelling is such an important element in presenting. It's not just presenting your thesis or your case study. It's really making it personal through storytelling. Um, have you engaged in formal or even informal formal research, right? Here again, did you learn something very specific on the job or something very specific in your academic life or or your personal life that caused you to dig deeper into that, that, that information? And then lastly, have you applied the knowledge? Um, have you done something that um, the lessons learned were, well, that didn't go very well, and I want to share this information, make sure people... Um, are aware of it, or I did something and it really had a big impact on, on my, my teams or my career or whatever. And I want, I want to share that for everyone. So kind of understanding the, the detail of the why, uh, is important and then organizing your thoughts. So here uh, again, Ali and, and Ian, this might be a little, I, you know, maybe I should do a spin off to the abstract because we do have a week plus we have the weekend and then, uh, well, we have till the 17th, I don't know how many days that is, um, to submit an abstract for a Kuho or for Northwest Akuho. So it's completely possible for you to come up with an idea, see your passion, organize your thoughts, write the abstract and submit it. Um, but I always start with an outline. Um, figure out the flow of what you wanna say. Um, it, it's useful to get to that 600 word abstract because if you're just 
rambling on with your typewriter, um, it's going to be harder to um, reorganize it. And it may be harder for the program committee to understand what your point is. So organizing your thoughts is always start there. It doesn't have to be a super detailed outline, but just, just layer it out. Um, like good writing, you should have an introduction. You should have the main content and a conclusion. I, I think that helps uh, the, the review panel understand what you're saying. And frankly, in the room as a, as a, as an attendee of your session, I will understand your flow if you've got a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, in at Malin, we often refer to a key overriding message, a KOM. Like, what's the big? What's that? Why? Make sure that why is very clear and it's up front. Don't and you know, don't, don't you know? Make sure it's integrated, but that you say your why up front. And again, speaking back to stories or a case study example, bringing visual aids, um, bringing anecdotes uh, helps cr create a, 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 a very lively session. Um, by way of example, Ali, your session last year that I attended was great. You brought visual aids, like, well, you brought aids to block one's vision or to block one's hearing because the message you were trying to convey was one about, you know, going beyond accommodations to going, going to empathy and understanding of um, individuals' different uh, differences. It was pretty powerful because you got to engage with the work. So um, organizing your thoughts, there we go. Considering the audience is also important, um, does your, uh, first off, while you're presenting to your peers, which is entirely um, expected at Northwest Akuho, you should assume they don't know what you know. Um, and that's not to be hubris or to be uh, overconfident. Just say, I've got something I wanna share and you may not know about it. So. So that helps in understanding who, who you're talking to. Um, getting back to accommodation, we should assume that someone in the audience may need accommodation. And Northwest Kuho is super good about making sure there's microphones, um, lighting is good, that there is a closed captioning. So you already are there because of the work you do, that you're being very thoughtful. Um, but oftentimes in certain conferences, uh, they don't think of that. And it goes a long way when you're taking that extra step to say, hmm, I really should be thinking some, you know, assume someone in the room does need that accommodation. Um, is the audience diverse mix of professionals or more similarly aligned? And what I mean by that is, yes, uh, the lion's share of the people in, in the room will be your peers that are grappling with many of the same issues, but there could be an architect in the room or a contractor or a vendor um, so, and they may have a different um, uh, professional background. So understanding it might help. And then um, as you think about your, your um, presentation, would um, audience participation enrich the experience? And again, going back to Allie's session last year, she engaged the audience. It wasn't just, I'm going to tell you something and, and it's good information, but I want you to experience it a little bit with me. That was, that was great. Uh, Self-care. Um, these are little things that actually help. Don't stay up too late, right? Get some good rest. Uh, in the morning, don't have too much coffee. I mean, if you need it, I need it. So I'm going to have some, but like, don't go overboard because you may find yourself actually jittery and that's not going to help your presentation. Um, you don't have to go hit the gym in the morning in the hotel either, but take a walk. Get some exercise, get your body moving before it. Uh, stay hydrated and and breathe. <laughs> Take deep breaths if you're feeling some nerves that morning. And that's totally natural and, and okay. But so um, being aware that you need to take care of yourself uh, before your presentation will make the presentation better as well. So so pro tips, I, the, kind of the little end. Um, what is your why if you truly sound passionate it's just going to be a better presentation. Um, if you are <clears throat> have a very strong command of that material, you will exude confidence. Uh, organizing your thoughts, there's a theme in sort of the, the reporting biz, don't bury the lead, which is to say, you have a main point, make it up front. Um, it's ironic, sometimes you get to the end and there's some thoughtful, provocative slide at the end and you're like, wait, 
that should have been up front. <laughs> it changed the way I've, I'm now understanding the, the last 50 minutes. Um, uh, keeping it simple and using plain language is important. Uh, and I'll get to that a little bit later um, in terms of some of the other things to avoid. And then I always, and I, I think conferences mostly provide water or maybe you're bringing your bottled water, but actually have some water with you. And don't be afraid to take a drink if you need it in the middle of your, your session because we got to stay hydrated. So um, let's assume you've written an abstract and the wonderful uh, program committee of Northwest Guho notified you that you are accepted. And now you've got between whatever time that is till the conference to get organized. And one, one of the things we want to do is practice. Um, so there's kind of two realms I want to dive into. There's the visual impacts that you can uh, harness or be aware of and the, the vocal impacts. So let's start with visual impacts. So eye contact. Eye contact's a big one. Um, it conveys, as, as is said here, sincerity and credibility. And it actually keeps you in touch with the audience, right? Um, however, <laughs> don't stare <laughs> at somebody. The four second rule, I don't I don't know if there's some great science around it, but if you're making eye contact with someone, at some point you're gonna wanna break that eye contact uh, and not just be staring at that person because it'll get weird for that person <laughs> and maybe yourself. Um, so varying eye contact around the room, not only at the front row as well, but all aspects. And I have had conversations with some of our staff or, or individuals that just eye contact is, it's hard. It's really hard. So a nice trick might be before you start is to pick a couple points in the room and remember them. Because if you are moving your eye to those points, it will still look like you're making eye contact with the room um, if that is just a, a, a real struggle for you. And that's understandable. It's just a trick. Uh, body language. Um, standing with confidence, uh, and this is where I might, you know, get up and, uh, you know, slouching or, um, just kind of like in this very casual posture is not good. You really should have both. You can't see my feet, but, um, stand with confidence. So sometimes we call it a power stance, but even that might send the wrong signal. It's just equal weight on both feet. And then when you're sitting also, don't be kind of in a slouchy mode. Um, you should be, you know, sitting and sitting upright and forward. So, and I think it's okay to sit and present if that uh, makes sense. Um, standing, you know, in a room obviously might give people a better sight lines to you. Um, so that's just something you want to make a decision about. I always move, um, but do it with purpose. Don't just move around bizarrely, <laughs> um, but it helps me feel comfortable in the room. Uh, but swaying is something that is just a little thing to avoid because it's kind of like you're holding a baby and you're, or you're, you know, anyway, um, I adopt a comfortable posture. Sometimes there's a lectern up there. I enjoy leaning against the lectern, but it's not for the whole 50 minutes. I might lean against it and it kind of conveys that I'm I'm a real human being or I'm slightly approachable. I'm not this wise sage of information. Um, so like varying the, the, the power stance from maybe leaning on something could be useful. And then stay in charge of your hands. You're seeing, you know, even on the small screen, my hands kind of whip around a little bit. Um, talking with your hands is useful. Too much of it can be distracting. Um, the outstretched arms, I think is kind of like, like this, it's it's just kind of an odd thing or, or pointing at people, you know, that's just not necessarily uh, useful and it might make someone else feel odd if you're pointing at them. So staying in charge of your hands, uh, physical emotion. So um, one of the things is using expansive gestures. So here again, if I'm presenting and I want to convey a message that you say, hi, I'm moving my hands, but I'm not doing this, right? That's you know, so like sometimes a, a expansive gesture or you're gesturing at your slide or you're moving over to your slide and you're pointing, doing it slowly 
um, and openly as opposed to being closed and kind of pointing is, is something um, to think about. Facial expressions are great. Smiling, doing, you know, doing, doing things that animate uh, is just a useful way to be approachable. Um, so again, letting that passion and enthusiasm flow, hopefully you're sensing that I'm passionate about this and I'm kind of excited to share these little tips with you. Um, so simulation sometimes can be effective, like, and I said, I eat charades, maybe um, simulating a bowling or simulating throwing or simulating some move that somehow conveys an aspect of what you're trying to get across is useful. If I were to just stand there and say, you know, I picked up this rock and then I threw it and it hit the water and it did a thing. If I'm just narrating that, I mean, it, I guess you're imagining it in your head. But if I said, you know, I picked up this rock and I looked at it and then I threw it, you know, like that's a little bit more engaging and a little bit more fun to experience. And then emotion. Whew. Um, I have talked about themes that get me choked up. And I have, I don't know if I've actually shed a tear, but you can hear my voice. Um, and I, I actually hate when I do that because I feel like I do it too much because I'm a pretty emotional person. But it does, um, I mean, it can be used to your advantage to, to the audience to see, wow, this this is an intense moment in, in the session. Or, or even just boisterous laughter sometimes can be useful. It, it, it maybe depends. And I wouldn't say go after those, make sure you show emotion. It's just, you're human. Uh, I once, um, hopefully I won't get emotional telling this story. <laughs> One of my earlier presentations, I used a picture of my daughter uh, to convey, you know, the the importance of sustainability in, in the future because they're the future and I'm, I'm already doing it. But I really kind of choked up and um, somebody came up to me after and just said, I appreciated seeing your humanity. Um, so, and I'm I'm, I'm kind of getting emotional now. You can hear it. Um, it's okay. It's okay because we are human, and these themes might be very important. Let's see, where am I going next? Oop. Oh, did I? Oops. Sometimes it's hard for me to. It's okay to show emotion. Why am I not advancing? There we go. Um, visual impact, spatial relationships. Um, you know, it kind of depends on the way the room set up, set up, but just don't be too close to, to the audience because somebody might, again, not, uh, uh, not feel comfortable with that, that spatial closeness. Um, you know, as much as the power stance is important, if you're facing the audience just this way, um, it, somebody might feel more it might feel confrontational. So if you can have a good stance, but maybe be angled, it might be more approachable and, and, and actually might be useful for you to then gesture to the slides if you have slides. So something to think about there. And then cultural and gender differences, um, you know, it's again about being aware of the room and the people in the room and um, just, just being thoughtful about it. Uh, okay, vocal impacts. Pace and volume. Um, match your content with the time allotted. So time management is key. I, I actually am glancing over to my my phone and I tap it because I want to see how much time we have here. Because guaranteed, if you're not paying attention to the, the, the 50 minutes that are allotted in your session and you've packed it full of content, you'll run right up to the end. You'll have given no one an opportunity to ask questions and it it won't feel as um as a complete a, a, a presentation so you know we're I, ian these are 50 minute sessions right at northwest Sakuho. i would advise yep oh sorry go ahead yeah okay confirm i would advise to be thinking about 30 minutes of content and you're like oh my god i'm gonna leave 20 minutes for q a yeah well First off, you'll normally run long, so maybe you'll end up 30, 35, 38 minutes, and you'll still have given people time for questions. And if there aren't any questions and people get up and leave early, you know what? That's fine. <laughs> so I would time management is super, super important. Um, 
if you have a soft voice, uh, a, a microphone might actually be useful for you as well as an accommodation for the room. But sometimes you really need to, you know, project your voice and it might feel like you're screaming. But the people at the back of the room, if they can't hear you, then they're not engaged in that experience. And it's also okay to check your voice and say, can you hear me in the back of the room? And if they're giving you the thumbs up, then you kind of know you that's where you got to be. Um, varying your rate of speech, if you can do that, is actually useful as well. Um, speaking too fast at the end is, is certainly tough because if you get too much content and you're going really fast and then the next slide and the next slide, people are like, I can't keep up with this person. However, varying the rate of speed just adds dimension to the presentation. So you could slow down because I've got a very important point I want to make. And you might even pause. But then you might just genuinely want to be excited about another piece of content. And I say, I, I got to tell you this great story. And so, so you can see that I'm slowing down and, and then speeding up as it maybe suits the, the content. Tone, inflection, and silence. Okay. Uh, just kind of noted um, moderating tone as it suits the contents. There's a difference between going slow and going fast. There's also maybe a difference of taking a moment and being a little bit more silent because there's a point you want to make. I need you to really consider the impact of this had on this student. So being softer will kind of bring people in and recognize that there's some, this is kind of, there's a powerful moment here. Inflection pauses and changes in your voice just help vary the presentation. So an inflection might be just like, look at that. Or if there's a very important point, give give a give a, give a pause, give space. Another thing that we hear often is at the end of a sentence, some people always stop their sentences like this, like they go up. Um, that kind of signals a lack of confidence. Um, so it's important that you're making a point to make sure that your point drop, you know, the end of the sentence you can drop. Because also signals that it's the conclusion of the thought. And if you're always speaking up like this, the audience might be like, is there something else coming? I don't know. Um, I kind of already articulated letting silence work for you. It's okay to let silence be a part of the presentation. It actually, sometimes you need it because you just lost your train of thought. It's okay. And that's okay too. You just need to go like, oh, okay. I forgot that. And give it a cent, give it a, give yourself a second to find your place again and begin again. I think out loud, I'll often tell you that I just lost my train of thought. Um, I don't know if that's good or bad, but it certainly shows that uh, I, uh, I'm thinking through it and you're a part of this. You're a part of the the good and the bad of my presentation. Um, I hope, hopefully that comes across as genuine, um, but it's okay to pause. So making eye contact, um, I mean, you're engaged with that audience. If you are acknowledging them that they're here and they're here to listen and a part of it. Um, body language, this is a silly little thing, but it's kind of, it's kind of important. Um, hopefully, well, you can't quite see, but standing and then putting your hands as fig leaves in front of you, <laughs> the lower portion of your body is kind of odd. So, um, pockets, you know, like just at your side is a good thing. Um, even when I, sometimes I'll do this, but I don't know if that's very inclusive. It might, I might look standoffish as if I've got my hands like this. So, it's almost like using your hands will help keep them from doing the things that are maybe not not great. Um, but anyway, the whole fig leaf thing, standing like this is like you're at church or you're covering your, your private parts is um, just, no, don't do that. All right, physical emotion. I, I mentioned that. Be physical and engaging and, and recognize that this is a little bit of stage presence. It's okay to think about this as a little bit of performance. Um, you're not in on Broadway, but you want people really enjoying this as much as learning something from it. Spatial relationships, if it's at all possible. Well, actually, I would say you need to go to the room early and you need to see the room and see the setup and then make changes as it suits your needs. 
moving tables, moving chairs, it's okay. You also need to put it back maybe the way you, you found it because of the next session. Pace and volume, again, breathe. Don't try and speed through your content. It's just, you get distracted. And there's plenty of distractions that everyone has at their fingertips um, to not listen. And then silence, again, you might need it to find your place, but but to articulate a point and then let that point sit there for a second is use it as a place of power. So here we are, 1032. I'm doing okay. Um, helpful hints to avoid. So I'm going to go through these five dimensions um, because they kind of drive me crazy at times internally. And I, I want to acknowledge uh, Mob Mohammed's in the room here. She's one of the amazing staff members at Malum, and I'm encouraging her to think about presenting as she's growing in her career. And uh, she's already doing a great job in the office, but I, I wanted her to come here and, um, and listen to some of this as well. Okay. Um, kind of, sort of, and like. It's okay. All of them are okay. But if you are constantly leaning on those, those words or those phrases as a crutch, it can just be distracting. If you're um, constantly like um, trying to get your um, words out, but um, you're like, what did I, what did I just say? I said a lot of ums. Um, <clears throat> and I just did it right there. Too much of it can also deliver a lack of confidence or you might lose the audience and now they're looking at their phone they're looking at the next session they're 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 online uh, grading you right now and it's not good uh, it just doesn't sound professional so tightening that up is important i know when we're casually talking we're like we're like saying this and like saying that got to dial that down um, this is important for everyone. Jargon, acronyms, and initialisms. In architecture, we've got lots of acronyms. SD and um, AHJ. And if you don't know what those are, I'm losing you when I s utilize them. When I say, oh, when we were in S the SD phase, we did this and we had to go speak to the AHJ. Uh, A you know, it's not good. And and the housing, ha you have jargon and, and um, acronyms and initialisms as well. So be mindful of that. Even if the audience is all housing professionals, I know they might pick up on that, but if you're not being very inclusive. So industry terminology, just be aware of it. Um, again, if you're just throwing those out, you're saddling the audience with figuring out what you're saying or they're researching online. What does SD mean, right? Uh, you, and, and if they're distracted trying to catch up with you, they might miss your big points. So all those, the jargon is, impor is, is important to be mindful of. Uh, don't read your notes. Kind of simple. It's okay to have notes. It's, a, it's actually okay to have note cards and be prepared. But if you are just sitting there reading your notes, next slide, and then back down reading your notes, uh, it's um, you know, not very engaging. And sometimes it might look like you're not prepared. Uh, don't stare at the screen. The slides are for the audience, not you, uh, which means you need to practice and you need to at least be pretty aware of what the next slide is. Now, sometimes you have a laptop in front of you and you, you know, PowerPoint allows you a little bit of a, a peek at what's next. And, and that's useful. I mean, use it. But I have seen lots of people that are... <clears throat> And you can see here that the uh, the what you know the the students uh, population is distributed this way. Next slide, and then also over here something's going on. And next slide, no, I'm not even looking at you. So those are the kind of things that just it it just really disconnects you from the audience. And this is about giving to them. Um, so that we talked about swaying, just no no swaying, even if you're uncomfortable, which is why if you feel like you're uncomfortable, just move around a bit. Put your hand in your pockets and go over to this side or maybe go to the other side of the slide and if you need to. Don't do it really fast, you know, because those kind of things, I should have a bigger screen. It's just kind of like confusing, confusing. So the pro tips. If you use ums and kind ofs and sort of a lot, just pause. I wanted to share with you this slide be, you know, because whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, I think you can use jargon or an acronyms 
just explain them. Uh, so when Mob and I went to the AHJ, now that's the authority having jurisdiction, and that's the permit folks that approve drawings. Well, now you know what it is. You don't have to commit it to memory, and then we can get on with our point. Um, I, again, I think notes are fine. When I see somebody with notes and they're sw swapping between them, but they're still making eye contact, they're excited. I'm like, good job. They they did they got prepared. And then uh, the the screen we talked about. And we talked about swaying. Just don't do it. Okay, about 1037. Final thoughts. Um, I just, I mean, especially in architecture, uh, I, I try and just let everyone know that there's some theater here. And I think we're we're supposed to come up with these brilliant ideas as architects and designers. And we're supposed to, we were, we studied the great architects and we presented during our academics and we all have to be creative and interesting. And I think society thinks architects are interesting, right? Um, there, there's always an architect uh, on some drama show or something. Um, I don't think I'm that interesting. <laughs> I don't think I'm that innovative. I've never thought that, but I, I like to have fun and, some of it is a little bit of theater, not not to like shed that tear at the right moment, but like you're on stage, own it. Um, I think your personality needs to come out. It, you might not have the same personality as me, which I don't know what you think of me right now, but like hopefully I'm approachable and a little goofy. Um, but just try and have fun and be passionate. If you like uh, humor, um, funny stories gets the audience laughing. I often, when I'm interviewing for a project with one of your campuses, I, I don't, I don't miss a moment to try and inject some humor because we're all people. We don't all have to be so serious all of the time. I think the personal insights are really powerful. If you have a story of uh, the point you're trying to make that is, that is personal, whether it's um, or professional, the storytelling is so important. And then, like I said, if you do all this right, people are going to be like, oh, my God, that was great. I, I, I want to go to, you know, next year's session. You're scrolling the uh, agenda and you see that Allie's presenting this year. Oh, man, she was so good last year. I'm going to go see her session again. I want more. So uh, there you go. I have some resources here. I don't know if it's might have been smarter for me to cut and paste them, but there are some you know, there's some sources online that might uh, have some of these themes repeated if you want to read them and process them again. But I really think um, the big, big message, and we can do questions, um, is this, this, this is, you can do this. So I'll stop right now on my little question slide and see if there are questions since nobody interrupted me during my flow. <laughs> Don't be shy. I mean, this is a wonderful, a wonderful presentation. I know <laughs> this is just wonderful. I truly appreciate it because I definitely struggle with some pre presenting and uh, the tonal inflection and like being mindful of like letting silence use you. I think yeah. that was my biggest thing because I I do not like silence. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I I mean I think this is just great, great information. Well, good. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it, it's going to work for everyone differently. Um, and I've been doing this for a long time, so I don't have any apprehension. It's okay to feel anxious, but there's so much learning when you step outside of your comfort zone. Even if, even if you give a presentation and it really didn't go well, that's like, and you walk away going, damn it. I really, I really wanted to do so much better you will get better because you put yourself out there and you learn from the experience. And I'm not suggesting for a minute, Junior, that if you presented, it would go poorly. I'm just saying um, there's a long runway to be feeling truly confident up on that stage um, and, and delivering the content. But again, if you've got a strong message, something you're passionate about and you prepare, it's going to be great. I almost guarantee it. Isn't that a commercial? I guarantee it. That's the men's warehouse. <laughs> Other thoughts? This is Megan. I don't know if anyone can hear me. I've been on my phone and cutting in and out this whole time. Uh, 
I, so I might've missed some things about this. I apologize. Um, How do you, Kurt, like personally, professionally address, you know, questions at the end of a presentation that you're not expecting or you're not prepared for, or that go, you know, off the rails of what you were expecting them to be? Because that happens a lot. I wondered if you have any tips, tips around that. (laughs) Great question. Maybe I need to work that into the Q and A. I should have some stuff in here. So you just did it in a way. So what my, sorry, no, no, what? No, <laughs> you just said it happens a lot. So there's no apologies. Um, I'm trying to think of something really powerful to say. I think honesty is the best policy is a cliche, but I think it works in this situation. So, and I, I wish I had a great example, um, but very often there'll be Somebody that asks a bit of a contrarian viewpoint or says, you know, I don't agree with the point you made about blank. And um, first off, acknowledging that individual saying, I appreciate that you had the, well, that you spoke up, that you had the courage to say, I disagree. Um, Because, and, and then I might go into just acknowledging that I might not have the right answer. I have the answer based on my experience and my experience is all I have to offer. But you just asked an interesting or uh, contrary point. Let's discuss that. So I think acknowledging the question, maybe even acknowledging the courage, and then spending time with it a little bit. Don't just dismiss it as, yeah, I I don't know. I think think you, you, you bring that person along, you include them, you don't have to agree, um, but you've acknowledged that there are diverse opinions. There are diverse experiences. And thank you for sharing. And then thanking them because now you've just learned something that you can either weave into another presentation or be mindful of in your own work. So I, I'm, I'm hoping I just, and then, and then what I just did <laughs> is sort of asking for affirmation. Did I, did I answer your question correctly or did we, did we spend enough time on it? Because I really, appreciated it and I wasn't prepared for it. So that all of that hopefully was versions of honesty is the best policy. You are not perfect. You are sharing content, but you do not know everything. I'm I'm in this 30 years and I will learn something, hopefully if the planning committee sub- accepts my abstract, because um, that's what I love about it. Thank you. Yeah. There was a comment in the chat. Uh, Ali said that um, I often follow up with folks afterwards if I don't have the answer and try to get them more information. So being able to engage with them uh, on a more one-on-one uh, basis and, and closing that loop by following following back up, uh, I think is uh, great as well. Yeah. So um, having someone else in the audience like Ali join the conversation and offer their observations is <laughs> was a great thing right here. And like, you can always say, um, when we're done, let's, let's exchange information. Cause I do want to follow up because everyone's hopefully got business cards or we can use our phones and get ourselves connected. And then it is the responsibility after the conference is done and you're back at your desk. Like, I really need to follow up on that and don't forget about it because then that person might be really wanting to hear from you, you, Megan, and and then you blew them off. And it wasn't intentional, but like intent and impact, like you had the intention of following through, but since you didn't, the impact was, hmm, well, so much for that. <laughs> yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Kurt, I know one of the things that's some, depending on the, I guess the, the pulse of the room and the questions that um, may come up at the end Sometimes to, to help engage the entire room, I will pose that question back to the to the room if I if I don't necessarily have that answer. Like, oh, that's a wonderful question. I hadn't thought of that. What do other folks in the room think about X, Y, Z? Now, depending again, you kind of have to assess whether or not that's gonna the type of question and and the feel of what's going on. If it's too contentious or like something yeah. uh, way off, but oftentimes a lot of the folks have great perspectives from their their institution of their own and that's a great way to engage with the audience as well yeah and, and this is this has been great and, and so i'll i'll even offer the following 
don't spend too much time on the one question because there may be other questions out there in the room and, and that's a hard thing to do to say you know i um i really appreciate this discussion and i think we should connect after but there may be some other questions in the audience so i want to give some time to make sure where everyone has a chance to be heard i mean it's all um being aware of what's going on in the moment and the only way you do that is if you're comfortable up there and you've prepped and you're you're honest so. i um especially when i was in college i used to watch a lot of TED talks to like learn the way they're presenting and i've noticed that often and a lot of them that will start with kind of a, a surveying question to the audience. Have you, do you find that helpful or kind of derailing? Or do you like, sometimes it's just like, raise your hand if you've done blah, blah, blah. Or sometimes it would just be like actual questions that you're trying to kind of test the temperature of the room. Have you done that? And do you find it helpful? Uh, yes. And Part of it might be in the way you've organized your session. So it, in Northwest Skuho, they actually have, I think, five different sections where it's in a, a roundtable discussion or a panel discussion or a case study. Like, so you might, in the crafting of your abstract, be intentionally saying, I want this to be interactive. And so I'm going to, so, so you've already sort of built it in. But um, sometimes I've watched, People just show of hands. Who who is a um, you know a, a mid level professional? And any are there any senior? You know, it's that's a simple question, but it but it actually starts engaging, um, or being able to stop your own flow because it just popped into your head. I'd like to ask the question: Who has dealt with blank in the audience? I it's supernatural and it's really great because. Um, Hopefully everyone's still paying attention. But if you ask a question, all of a sudden people are like, wait, what was, oh yeah. And now they're, they're back. They're, they've reconnected. So it, it's a good strategy. It could be planned or unplanned, but it, you also don't have to do it. But yeah, the Ted talk folks, I mean, they're really on stage. So there's a lot of theater going in as well as powerful content. Don't get me wrong. I've never done one. I've never been up on a stage like that. I kind of would love to, but I bet I would be pretty intimidated too because you're just all alone on that stage. So, got, we still got some time. If you're even thinking of an abstract and want to just brainstorm with this group, toss it out there. See, we've got a bunch of silence there. It's kind of weird, right, Junior? All that silence. <laughs> I have okay. a question. Sorry, yeah, my sure. camera's not working right now, but I do have a question for you. Um, how do you ground yourself when you talk about topics that are emotional? I've yeah. I've done it before and I could not ground myself. So the entirety of my presentation was me in tears trying to finish. <laughs> Um, uh, so how do you do that? Because you just did it. Um, so do you have any tips for someone who's just also a human that wants to make those types of personal like stories in their presentations, but yeah. also needs to stay grounded? Um, well, I appreciate the term staying grounded because um, I don't know if how, when you came into this, but I actually was sharing a story of a presentation that I gave and I started to get a little fluttery because uh, I do do that a lot. And I, it kind of drives me nuts um, because at some point I feel like, am I just a blubbery mess? And I've made, I've, I've gone past impactful to uncomfortable. <laughs> so I, I, I'd give you a big hug if I could right now, Laura, because I, I, do I have some tips? Um, the only thing I could offer is maybe the content can't all be deep, heavy stuff that, and, and this, this was pretty easy because it's something that I think I'm sharing with you and it, I'm not talking about my daughters or I'm not talking about a really powerful conversation I've had with a student 
and I have done that before and it does get me choked up. Um, uh, yeah, so, so maybe making sure the content isn't all heavy, that there's light and fun in it and uh, content that is really good information that you can do it with a professional tone um, and that those moments that are deeply personal or deeply uh, impactful are are metered and so that goes to a little bit of organizing your thoughts and then practicing um and yet i don't you know the anxiety still is there when you're live in front of the audience you can do it in your the mirror of your bedroom and you'll nail it and you'll nail it and you're like i can do this and it's still it's there's still going to be that um the butterflies the other thing would be to just pause and just recompose yourself get a glass of water I will often acknowledge my emotion. I'm like, I'm really sorry. I'm getting emotional about it. That doesn't cure anything necessarily, um, especially if you have to dive back into the second part of your story. Um, yeah, I mean, that's what I have for you. I struggle with it as well. I've often thought I want to get more presentation training to, to, to help that. And I, I haven't really figured out a source. It's it's about breathing. It's about being human and honest and maybe not just layering 50 minutes uh, or 35 minutes of content of just deep, heavy stuff. So hopefully that's helpful. Yes, thank you. Maybe we got time for one more question, one more idea. So when you were saying uh, to share your own stories or when you were talking about the concept of your presentation to make it something personal, how do you kind of like hit that balance between you're rambling and you're telling too many too much information yeah. and you're saying just enough to convey the story and the message in the story? Um, great question. And I, and I think don't always just practice in front of the mirror get your partner or one of your colleagues and say, I want to practice in front of you. And, and I want you to listen to, you know, to make, I want, I want you to listen for, am I getting my point across or, um, because it helps just kind of clarify things. Um, if, if you don't mind, Mob, can I, can I share the recent presentation you gave? So, so Mob, uh, internally we have a, project presentations and all the projects in the office are presented in in, in short burst and mob was giving a presentation about the so sort of the bike uh, shelter redesign we're doing at oregon state so she pulled me in and we she ran through it and i listened and timed her and then when she was done we went back through and i said you know i know this is an important detail in the actually the execution of the project but dump it it's not important um, she presented uh, the schedule of the project. And it's like, you know what? The audience doesn't even care about that. They What they do care about is the different um, dimensions of how you're studying the project. So like, I guess that's the biggest message is um, have someone listen with a, a, an ear for helping you clarify your points. Which she did clarify. She got it on time and it was really good. <laughs> Thank you. I, I've noticed that I struggle with that even when I talk to friends is that I will think that these details are important. important. It was a blue sky. It was warm. And my yeah. friend was wearing that and then realized that none of that was helpful to anything I was about to say. Yeah. And, and to be clear, those are important details. It's not that they're not Im not important. It's just when you are doing time management and you're trying to convey a point, sometimes... um the details can just drift away. Now you just mentioned the blue sky and things like that. There's a adding color and, and dimension to the point is actually important. Uh, it's kind of like I, uh, I gave mob a flower. That is a correct statement. But when you can say something like I had picked this Lily that had just started to bloom and I presented it to mob to say whatever, whatever, like the, the adjectives and the color makes it more vibrant, right? So there is like, okay, I'm, am I contradicting myself now? Get to the point or make sure the point is, 
is is um, enjoyable as well. That there's the detail that you can really and you can smell the scent of the the the, the lily freshly picked or whatever. I don't know. Let's make it. So there's a little bit of that. All right, Ian, I think I just want to like, you guys got this. You can do it. Um, step out of your comfort zone and make it happen. You'll be, you'll surprise yourself and, um, you know, you'll keep, you keep honing that skill and it will serve you not only at a conference, but in your professional lives as well. So I just wanted to say thank you for coming and engaging and asking good questions. And hopefully this was a useful time for you. Thank you, Kurt. Appreciate it. Hope to see you at Northwest Kuhil. Thank yeah. you, Kurt.